hello students so in my discussion so far about american realism i have tried to cover all the heads which are there in the syllabus of jurisprudence in relation to american realism and the last one which i was talking about so far was uh, as to how american realism is a gloss on sociological jurisprudence and in this context i talked about how the movement of public interest litigation in india has actually showed us that uh, that judiciary can actually be the instrument for furthering the cause of sociological jurisprudence by addressing and mainstreaming the cause of marginalized those whose cause so far remain unattended because of lack of political voice of the marginalized in the indian polity however at the same time i also discussed as to how this uh, this kind of uh, uh, judicial activism whereby the sociological jurisprudence cause of uh, addressing the mundane ordinary day to day issues of human beings have been highlighted to what extent this kind of judicial activism actually is problematic when we view the same through the prism of the constitutional doctrine of separation of powers and therein i discussed uh, the various uh, mainly two distinct uh, a uh, set of voices one endorsing it and the other opposing it and uh, i told you that the one which endorses it endorses it by mainly looking at the outcome produced of such judicial interventions in terms of its success of actually mainstreaming uh, mainstreaming such discourses in our indian polity and at the same time uh, playing the role of a catalyst in ensuring that those concerns uh, remain attended and those concerns are not forsaken merely because of the fact that addressing the same may not be politically expedient and the other side disagreeing with this arguing that uh, if you are if you are actually talking about legitimacy of a judicial intervention then the legitimacy cannot be ascribed by f by looking at the outcome produced because when we are talking about legitimacy of the intervention we are talking about whether the intervention at the first in instance was justified or not and therefore this cannot be justified by saying that uh, even if the intervention was not justified but the fact that the intervention has yielded better results and therefore Uh, the intervention is legitimate they argue that this is a flawed approach because separation of power is not about what is the outcome produced of a of a particular judicial intervention but whether the judicial intervention in the first instance is permissible intervention or not and we have seen that public interest litigation in that context uh, provides for a very uh, a very debatable proposition because public interest litigation is mainly endorsed uh, because of the results that it has yielded uh, especially addressing the cause of poor and marginalized but at the same time there is a very strong body of opinion which also believes that public interest litigation has perhaps uh, enabled the court to intervene in in possibly every affair of uh, governance and therefore there is nothing in in contemporary times which is beyond the reach of uh, court in terms of uh, uh, the issue being adjudicatory and therefore this is very very problematic because it leaves us uh, with no clear understanding of what is the the role of executive and legislature and what is the role of judiciary now uh, moving on <clears throat> uh, today i'll uh, talk about uh, one last thing in american realism which is those specifically not mentioned in the in uh, mentioned as a head in the syllabus nevertheless something which is these days uh, very very uh, uh, important and something which is very talked about and this is uh, this is predicting judicial outcomes 
given rise to a very uh, interesting field of study uh, wherein uh, the researchers try and predict the judicial outcome. Now, <clears throat> this task of predicting judi the judicial outcome so far as the legal scholarship is concerned has actually uh, looked at this in two distinct ways. One, wherein based on study of the of the cases or a study of the judgments that has been delivered so far by an individual judge the the possible outcome of a particular case based on the composition of the bench to which a particular that case is assigned uh, a prediction is attempted so if a judge is is based on the kind of judgments that he or she has delivered if the judge say for example is known to be pro prosecution because the judgments that he has delivered so far appears to convey this message that even if there is uh, not very strong evidence against the accused uh, likelihood of uh, conviction at the hand of that particular judge is more because uh, he seems to be swayed by this uh, by this fact that uh, crime needs to be arrested in our society and therefore allowing an accused to go scot free based on uh, uh, based on uh, deficiencies that our system may have is probably not uh, correct and therefore uh, even if uh, the the evidence is not adequate enough uh, probably uh, looking at the other way around there has to be a clear evidence of uh, the person's innocence uh, rather than uh, rather than the person's guilt and therefore uh, for smallest of evidences available perhaps it is possible to convict that person and therefore uh, a judge may actually appear to be uh, to be following this particular policy objective as opposed to this uh, there can be a judge who may believe in the fact that uh, I, oh, irrespective of my personal opinion and irrespective of the fact that the rate of uh, conviction in case of criminal cases in India is abysmal uh, I cannot take uh, this as an opportunity whereby I can add to the, the, the rate of conviction uh, in India in criminal cases and therefore try and increase that uh, percentage of uh, conviction in India. I will always go by the evidence produced before me and I'll always go by this uh, fundamental principle which is that the prosecution has to prove the case beyond reasonable doubt and therefore I cannot pay lip service to this, this, this fundamental principle by actually convict, convicting accused persons even if I am not very convinced by the prosecution's case that it has actually established the case beyond reasonable doubt. Now these are two distinct approaches. Uh, but um, if, if obviously one, if one will read the judgment, uh, these, uh, uh, these preconceptions would not be mentioned. However, uh, we know now that we have studied rule skepticism, we know that there is a difference between what judges do and what they say they do. So in this, in this example, even if a judge uh, who is pro-prosecution is actually saying that the prosecution has proven the case beyond reasonable doubt, we based on our study of his past judgments are in a position to say that this is just for the sake of uh, saying things because the judge knows that uh, he is not in a position to alter the fundamental principles of criminal justice and therefore his uh, uh, preconceptions will have to be accommodated, reconciled uh, at, at least in the theoretical backdrop of the fundamental norms of criminal justice system and therefore even if uh, not sufficient evidence is there to actually bring home the guilt of the accused if that if the judge wants to convict that the judge can only convict if he also simultaneously writes in his judgment that the prosecution has proven the case beyond reasonable doubt so that is what 
that is what these studies are actually intended intended for uh, for achieving it is not to see as to what the judge has actually written but it is to see that what possibly it was the real motivation behind the judgment so as as i said that the that there is a difference between what judges do and what they say they do so these kind of studies are actually intended towards ascertaining what they actually do rather than what they say they do and based on this uh, Yeah, we find that uh, that especially in in, in appellate court, especially in Supreme Court of India, every judge uh, by now has some kind of reputation in relation to his or her inclination to a particular ideology, and and this is mainly uh, b- based on uh, a study of the kind of judgments that 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 particular judge has delivered so far as a judge. so uh, if you read fali nariman's book fali nariman's uh, autobiography before memory fades so he'll, he writes a, a chapter on judges with agenda and therefore and therein he mentions uh, justice krishna iyer as having a socialist agenda justice uh, justice uh, subarao as somebody who is who was having a political agenda and uh, kind of also endorses justice iyer's uh, ideology by saying that uh, that a constitutional court judge probably in india ought to have a, a socialist ideology uh, a, an ideology which favors uh, the interest of downtrodden so this is what i am talking about that uh, this american realism wherein we have uh, we now know that it is not what is being told to us by way of judgments which is the real motivation behind the judgment so the idea by this kind of study is to actually try and find out the real motivations the real reasons behind a particular judge judge's decision and therefore based on this uh, you predict the judicial outcome if you again find the same judge sitting to decide a case which is before him or her now coming to our the next very significant and uh, talked about concept of jury matrix <clears throat> now what is jury matrix uh, in the last slide you saw that uh, we were talking about predicting judicial outcomes and therein i talked about as to how uh, these days uh, researchers interested in judicial process research on with a research with a view to find out the motivations of individual judges uh, with a view to all find out the ideological inclinations uh, of individual judges and based on uh, the findings of of their study uh, an attempt is made to predict the outcome of a case uh, by looking at the composition of the judges who have the responsibility of uh, adjudicating that case now this was a, an approach wherein in the purpose was to find out the individual motivations individual ideological inclinations uh, individual principles which a particular judge favors a particular judge uh, thinks that uh, Uh, this is the right approach for a for a judge to actually follow now what this jury matrix is jury matrix is also an exercise wherein the attempt is to predict the judicial outcomes but herein the approach is not to find out the individual motivation of individual judges so that we are in a position to know uh, the possible outcome if the case is before a particular judge that is not the purpose the purpose here is to actually concentrate on judges of a particular court as a group so this is a group approach of predicting judicial outcomes and this is this is also if one reads the research articles based on this approach one would find that find it to be very mathematical and therefore mechanical so it would predict the the percent per, it would predict the possibility of a particular judicial outcome in percentage terms uh, 
if such a matter were to go before the court so for example <clears throat> these days uh, especially after uh, after chief justice former chief justice gogoi having accepted the offer of the government of india to become a nominated member in the upper house of parliament that is rajya sabha uh, several um, critiques were written about uh, as to how this was an inappropriate uh, inappropriate choice uh, and inappropriate offer by the government and also the fact that how chief justice gogoi was wrong in accepting this offer because it creates doubts so far as his independence as a judge of the supreme court and as the chief justice of india is concerned now uh, if if you have read uh, an article also written by pratap bhanu mehta published in the indian express on the same issue of uh, justice gogoi having accepted this offer of rajya sabha nomination uh even uh, pratap bhanu mehta has uh, uh, referred to an article written by madho na su subhankar dam dam and giovanni co you can find this article on ssrn and the title of the article is jobs for justice corruption in the supreme court of india now what the authors of this article have tried to do that based on an empirical study of cases decided by the supreme court from 1999 to 2014 they have tried to establish the fact that there appears to be a connection between uh, a, a judge uh, writing the judgment in favor of the government and the same judge after his retirement accepting an important a prestigious post at the behest of the government so by this what is it that they are trying to suggest they are trying to suggest that the authors by way of empirical study are actually trying to suggest that there is a connection between judgments handed out by the supreme court of india and promise for a prestigious post to be offered to them uh, post the post their retirement and this obviously is alarming this people talk about this but the fact that you have uh, a paper published by uh, by <clears throat> scholars from uh, columbia law school and from uh, uh, other respected uh, international schools is ample testimony of the fact that how this exercise is taken seriously and not only by way of mere rhetoric but also try and they have made an attempt to demonstrate this connection between uh, between pre retirement judgment and the post retirement jobs uh, by way of their uh, empirical findings and this is certainly alarming Uh, so they have not in this article talked about individual judges the purpose is to actually demonstrate that perhaps supreme court as an institution wherein most of the judges appear to be inclined towards accepting post retirement offers and there appears to be a trend in relation to those judges who have accepted those post retirement offers uh, in terms of their judgments wherein they have they they have written uh, their decisions in favor of the government and this obviously is alarming but having an empirical evidence to make this point is obviously uh, a very important contribution to the existing literature on the subject likewise uh, you can find another article uh, uh, written by professor tarunav khetan uh, an nls bangalore Uh, alumna uh, alumna and uh, presently professor in the um, in in melbourne law school and oxford law school uh, he has written an article you can find this article also in uh, on ssrn the article is titled the indian supreme court's identity crisis a constitutional court or a court of appeals the title is the indian supreme court's identity crisis a constitutional court or a court of appeals now in this article what he has tried to do in his paper professor tarunav khetan uh, 
talks about the fact as to how the Supreme Court of India, when it comes to admitting the special leave petitions under Article 136 of the Constitution of India, which is a discretionary uh, remedy and uh, there is no right to appeal to the petitioner. The petitioner is supposed to prove his case as to why his case is to be admitted for hearing by the Supreme Court. Uh, Professor Khetan, based on the study of uh, 1,100 cases that he has made spanning over uh, more than 11 years, has concluded that reasons for the admission of special leave petitions by the Supreme Court of India appears to be extraneous and the one which is actually not grounded in law. He has in his study found that in most of the cases wherein the petition was argued before the Supreme Court for its admission by the designated senior advocates, the Supreme Court appears to be more inclined to admit the petition. Whereas uh, when the petition is, is, is actually moved before the Supreme Court by a junior advocate, the likelihood of the same being admitted under Article 136 is not very bright. Now, on what basis uh, Professor Khetan is making this uh, argument? Obviously, one based on the stats that most of the cases appears to be uh, the one wherein admission has happened. The cases are the ones wherein the petitioner's case was argued by the senior advocate. So, this obviously is a fact. Now, secondly, why is he calling this an extraneous it, extraneous uh, factor to be taken into account by the Supreme Court? It is based on the, his finding that despite the fact that the cases were in fact admitted for hearing, the actual result of those petitions after, the, after hearing the case on merits by the Supreme Court is actually the one wherein majority of those cases have been rejected by the Supreme Court. And on this, he says, should not have happened because, because of the high threshold for admission of uh, such cases before the Supreme Court, there has to be a very strong case, a strong chance of uh, s that petition actually succeeding in the Supreme Court and therefore the decision uh, in most likely scenario should be in favor of the petitioner. Whereas what has happened uh, that in most of the cases, despite the fact that the cases had been admitted by the Supreme Court for hearing, the on merits the court have not decided the case in favor of the petitioner. Now on this he says that this is this clearly seems to suggest that when it comes to admission, uh, the Supreme Court is not particularly bothered as to whether the grounds for the admission are well founded or not. The Supreme Court appears to be swayed by the fact that since the senior advocate happens to be moving this case before us for admission, we should be more than inclined to admit it. Now, uh, Professor Khetan is obviously making a different point by highlighting this. He is saying that Supreme Court, apart from being an appellate court, is also a constitutional court. And if this is the approach of the Supreme Court for admission of cases when the admission is actually discretionary at the behest of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is filling its own docket and thereby increasing its own workload. And the flip side of this is that because of the fact that the Supreme Court is, uh, is over So continuing from where I left in my last slide, so because of the fact that Supreme Court is also a constitutional court apart from being an appellate court, if the exercise of discretion by the Supreme Court in its appellate jurisdiction is not wise, the court is actually filling its docket and therefore thereby increasing its workload. And this has an adverse impact on the Supreme Court's functioning as a constitutional court. And we all know how important uh, habeas corpus petitions after the revocation of uh, Article 370 in Kashmir and the very revocation of Article 370 itself is lying uh, pending before the Supreme Court for months together. And uh, this is obviously alarming if the court is, is admitting petitions uh, in its appellate jurisdiction without exercising the kind of discretion which is expected of it under the Constitution it will obviously adverse, adversely impact the Supreme Court's function as a constitutional court because the court will always find it difficult to give 
constitutional uh, matters that much time because in in bigger constitutional ma constitutional matters you need to have more number of judges compared to ordinary cases where ordinary uh, cases wherein uh, even a, even a two judge or three judge bench of the supreme court can decide the matter so this is the point which uh, professor tarunav khetan is trying to make that if the supreme court of india were to function as an efficient constitutional court then perhaps it needs to wisely look into its uh, jurisdiction as an appellate court and only take up those matters in its appellate jurisdiction where its wherein its interference is actually warranted and wherein its non interference would result in uh, uh, result in injustice being carried out so that is it for today uh, i hope uh, Uh, you would try and understand what all we discussed discussed today and also read the two papers that i discussed while discussing the concept of jury matrix if you have any uh, questions and observations to make about what we discussed today please feel free to write to me at manvendra dnlu@gmail.com thank you very much have a good day